flooding in Savannah to snow flurries in the low country. We'll take a look at what else Mother Nature has in store for the rest of the week. Crews work around the clock to build a new home for a former soldier injured in Iraq. And the city of Harneyville celebrates a new location for its police department and courthouse. Fox 28 is the coastal source. Now, Fox 28 News at 10. Hey, and good Saturday evening to you. I'm Nikki Gaskins. If you've been outside today, you know it is freezing cold. So cold, in fact, that in Beaufort County, our cameras caught some snow flurries earlier this morning. Unfortunately for you snow lovers out there, it did not last long and was not enough to build a snowman. In Savannah here, people dealt with a different problem. High tides made for some difficult driving conditions this morning. On General McIntosh Street, drivers had to deal with several inches of water on the road in front of the downtown Marriott. This is a recurring problem because the roads are not high enough. And to see what else is going on in Mother Nature this, the rest of the week, let's go ahead and head over to meteorologist Gene Hopkins. Yeah, there was some weird weather going around. Luckily for Bluffton, they didn't get below freezing last night, just like here. But yeah, high tide was a little over eight feet. Comes the perfect time when that low was working its way with that wind out of the east. And as you can see, those uh, streets were flooding out there right now. Things are looking clear. And as you said earlier, they are getting cold, already colder than we were for the overnight low last night. But uh, looking at a little bit of clouds up to the north there. But uh, around town here, we're looking at lots of stars out there. You'll see after about lunchtime today, a little bit of clouds work their way off the coast. The area of low pressure continues to work its way up. What we see all day today was lots of sun. Didn't get that warm, a little bit warmer than uh, we were past few. But uh, right now, we're already at freezing in Savannah. 30 for Savannah, 29 for Statesboro, 32 for Vidalia. And we're going to continue to drop even more than this tonight. There's your forecast for tonight, clear and very, very cold. Winds out of the northwest around a 5 to 10, 24 for Savannah. 22 for Hampton, 23 for Statesboro, but um, things will get better. Trust me, I'll have your five day forecast coming up. All right, thanks, James. Flooding homes at lightning speed is the new trend in our area. First Savannah, then Beaufort. Now it's Hindville's turn. Crews hard at work for the second straight day, building a brand new home for a former soldier who lost his legs serving in Iraq in 2005. In our military source report, Nick Paradise brings us the update on this weekend's build. It's just an overwhelming, great feeling, knowing that uh, so many people care about wounded soldiers. Grateful. The word applies not only to Jason Letterman, the man receiving this home, but also to the guys given the opportunity to build it. We've done houses before and a few things for charity work, Habitat for Humanity. But this, is, this is more important and, and this is something that we're, we're really putting quality into this house and making sure that the Letterman family gets a maintenance-free house. Jason was hit by an improvised explosive device in 2005 and often uses a wheelchair to get around. Recently, he found Homes for Our Troops, a nonprofit group that specializes in helping wounded warriors. We've built 85 homes so far and turned the keys over all across the country, from California to Oregon to Florida. Builders were on site until around 10 last night. Yeah, we, we run. Today they worked on the roof and electrical and plumbing system. Sunday we're going we're gonna to start brick in the morning. We're going to have sheetrock going on inside. So we'll have drywall, we'll cover up all the stuff, and we'll have brick going up the facade of the building. They may have been inspired by Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Normally Homes for Our Troops takes about three months to finish the house, but the builders here at Hinesville are promising to finish this in just a few weeks. No surprise to Staff Sergeant Letterman. These guys are all over. These guys are professionals. And then you got all these soldiers and other people trying to help out too, passing up boards, doing everything they can possibly do to help out. Lewis says Hinesville's came together to build this house like no other community she's seen. Nick Paradise, WJCL, Fox 28, thecoastalsource.com. Workers hope to hand over the keys to Jason Letterman in about two weeks. Congressman Jack Kingston made a stop in Savannah this morning. The Republican representative spoke to members of the Georgia Association of Conservation at their annual meeting in the downtown Hyatt. Kingston was recently named the chair of the Subcommittee on Agriculture. He advises anyone receiving federal aid to get ready for some belt tightening. Like any other federal program right now, figure out what you do best, what maybe you can consolidate, what you can cut, because that way you're part of the discussion, and that is the discussion right now. Kingston also expect, expressed optimism that Congress can work together to improve the health care reform legislation passed last year. The city of Hardyville celebrates a new location for its police department and courthouse. 
Hardyville held a ribbon cutting ceremony at the building on Martin Street. Through grants and other funds, the city purchased it for $650,000. The building includes new and modern security features. City leaders hope the new building will help revitalize the downtown area. With the growth that's being experienced here in Hardyville, you know, it's, it's a nice progression for us. Um, if you look at the before picture, people are absolutely amazed at how much we've progressed and transitioned in the last three and a half years. Every city needs a modern police department. Um, we have a court system here. We keep our evidence there. And also inside this building is a warehouse where we can keep our automobiles in case of a hurricane or something like that. Now the building was purchased two years ago from a telephone company. This, year, this year's Low Country Living Home and Garden Show brought thousands of people to Savannah and turned giving the city a big boost to its economy. Major Johnson takes us inside the big events. From those with a green thumb. Just stopped in to, uh, you know, look around at some outdoor things. I love, you know, working out in my garden. To those trying to spice up that curb appeal. I think it's very important how your outside of your home looks if you're going to sell. The annual home and garden show is bringing in just about everyone looking for a deal. We have absolutely everything you could possibly imagine from the front door to the backyard. We've got thousands of square feet of landscaping and gardens, kitchen and bath trends. We've even got complimentary wine tasting and gourmet food. With over 150 vendors, this is one of the largest shows so far, making a big impact on the economy. It brings a lot of people downtown into Savannah to enjoy the community and the restaurants and the dining after the show. So it not only is good for the home show, but it's also good for the community. Including the wall wizard, Brian Santos. Make it simple, make it fast, make it fun, and save money. Because in this economy, if you can't move, you improve. And what better place to come and learn about your home than a home and garden show? And this is one of the best in the whole area. Offering such tips as how to paint windows using chapstick. So what do I do? I use a little bit of chapstick. I go around the inside of the glass window and lays down a wax release. Now when you go to paint, you go ahead, slop a little bit on the glass, let it dry, cut it off, <laughs> pull it off, done. So you need, but you need a lot of chapstick, right? Yeah, well, you, you know, like it's a dollar it, twenty nine. <laughs> okay, it's a cheap, cool tool. We right. like that. Many vendors make it a point to come every year. Local vendors love coming to this show, especially ones like B&M Pool Spa and Patio, who say they enjoy a huge boost in their sales. The show brings qualified buyers all in one location, so your advertising money, you know you're going to have people to talk to and the opportunity to sell your products. Buyers like Hal Copeland say it feels good to contribute to the economy. A lot of people are suffering, and you know, I'm, I'm thankful I have a good job, you know, and, and we're not, so we like to come back and contribute to the different artists that, that are here and, and help them out too. The event also features show-only discounts and pricing, helping to make sure that those that come to the show get a deal and help the economy to grow. Deidre Johnson, WJCL Fox 28, thecoastalsource.com. Tomorrow is the last day for the show. Doors open at 11 a.m. Coastal Pet Rescue is hoping to find some pets a good home. The nonprofit organization set up shop at the Home and Garden Show. Organizers are raising funds for veterinarian care. They are also trying to find homes for pets most in need. The agency is known for helping abused, neglected, and homeless dogs. We are a foster home organization. We don't have a shelter people can come to. So it's important for us to be visible in the community, and this is one great way for us to do that. This is the sixth year that Coastal Pet Rescue has participated in the show. Police need your help locating a man they say who shot another man to death. This is 26-year-old Rajon Amos. He's wanted for aggravated assault stemming from a shooting incident just four days before Christmas. It's important that we get Rajon off the street as soon as possible. The trouble started the night of December 21st at the Fred Wessels apartment complex. Metro police responded to the call of uh, a person shot here in the 200 block of Wilder Drive. The victim was shot multiple times. Upon officer's arrival, the victim, uh, Mr. James Outland, had already been transported by uh, a friend to Memorial Hospital. He'd suffered multiple gunshot wounds. Detective Josh Hunt says it was an argument between a husband and wife that triggered the shooting. There was a domestic dispute out here between a husband and a wife. Uh, the victim, James Outland, tried to intervene and, and break up the domestic dispute. The wife eventually left but brought back her boyfriend, Rajon Amos, who started firing rounds. When Rajon came out of this car and started shooting, there was a large group of people, women and children. I mean, he could have hit anybody. Hunt says Amos has a violent history, and that's why they want him off the streets before he strikes again. Anybody that, uh, that comes in contact with him should use, use caution and consider him a threat. 
Luckily, the victim in that incident did survive his injuries. Still ahead on Fox 28 News at 10, a woman shoots a dog after it attacks two loved ones. Now she's the one in trouble. Plus, two police officers are killed while serving an arrest warrant. Find out where after the break. Well, it's a little bit of drizzle, but if you liked what we saw for the afternoon, I have a feeling you're going to like tomorrow and the beginning of the week. You'll find out coming up in the full forecast. And welcome back. A huge explosion after a tanker truck filled with fuel crashes with a pickup in Marriott Island, Florida. Two people were killed in the accident. Fox's Daryl Nail has the story. It sounded like a bunch of metal scraping. And it, was, it was really loud. Joshua Aruda and his buddy Mark Smith were working when they heard the crash and ran outside. And as soon as I looked outside, you could see a fireball. As soon as I stepped out the door, I felt the heat just slap me in the face. It was so hot. Seconds later, and fire was everywhere. And in the middle of it, a Ford F-150 with a young female driver inside and a truck driver inside an exploding fuel tanker. I went to run into the smoke, and Josh is like, don't stop, stop. We were on the bridge. He was trying to run in there, and I could see the gas going down the slope. And that's when I pulled him back and it exploded again. The Florida Highway Patrol says the young female driver of the F-150 and a tanker truck full of fuel were both headed westbound this afternoon. The driver of the Ford went to pass the tanker but lost control and smacked it along its side. Both vehicles went crashing down the overpass embankment until they hit the bottom and exploded into flames. I, I can't begin to tell you how intense it was and I don't even want to estimate the temperature of it because there was such a large volume involved. I was at my boundary my physical boundary. Without burning my clothes, I, I couldn't get any closer. There was nothing we could do. We sat there, literally sat there and watched the truck burn. And Both drivers were killed, and the workers' heroic efforts fell short. But Mark says his buddy Josh still saved his life. Because I would have been right in there, and the second explosion might have got me. What'd you say, Josh? Thanks, bro. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> A North Carolina woman admits to shooting a pit bull after it bit her two-year-old daughter. Tashika Beatty says she was keeping the dog for a friend for about a month. However, at one point, the dog bit her daughter, then went after the girl's father. Beatty says she had to do something. I can't even tell you what was really going through my mind at that time. All I could think about was my baby. And I feel like that's what everyone is forgetting is my baby and it's been focused on the dog. Durham police charged Beatty with animal cruelty. In Miami, two police officers are shot and killed while trying to serve an arrest warrant on a homicide suspect. As Fox's Richard Jordan tells us, the killings have left city officials and the victim's fellow officers stunned and grieving. A day on the job erupts in tragedy, 69th Street and Northwest 7th Avenue, the center of a shootout that put the target on Miami-Dade police officers. One officer, Roger Castillo, died at the scene, his body removed with a police escort. In this ambulance, Officer Amanda Haworth taken to Jackson Hospital. She went into surgery, but she did not survive. These officers um, died in the line of duty very heroically. 
A third cop treated for a minor knee injury but released. <laughs> Police say the wanted suspect they were after, Johnny Sims, was killed on the spot. His body and that of one of the fallen officers covered by this tarp. It's a horrifying sight. I saw two on the ground. I saw two of them screaming, people, kids screaming. It was just a nightmare. The officer serving an arrest warrant at a home. Families are devastated by what happened here today. I, I mean, I really... God almighty, I know there's more cop shows on television than there is about any other topic at all. We see them, there's a million of them, so people think they know us. Each announcement of the fallen officers brings officials to tears. The other officer? We lost, we lost one. I'm sad to report that the second officer involved in this uh, shooting incident um, has, uh, has lost her life. It's shocking, it's, uh, it's hurtful. Uh, Really, I can't put it into words. A chain reaction car crash along a South Carolina highway sends 15 high school students to the hospital. The wreck happened on Interstate 26 near the Woodruff exit. A District 6 spokesperson says 37 students were on the bus. 15 were taken to a nearby hospital to be checked out. All have been treated and released. Most of the students on board are from Dorman High School. The cause of the crash is under investigation. Coming up on Fox 28 News at 10, a doctor faces an eight-count murder indictment for conducting abortions inside his office. Plus, we'll take you inside the funeral of a man who once served as President Kennedy's first director of the Peace Corps. And welcome back. The issue of abortion is playing out on a gruesome stage in Philadelphia, but the usual politics on abortion have been overwhelmed, at least locally, by the sheer shock value of the alleged crimes. Fox News correspondent Doug McKelvey has a story. The eight-count murder indictment against Dr. Kermit Gosnell of Philadelphia reads like the script of a horror film. From this building in West Philadelphia, he allegedly performed hundreds of illegal late-term abortions. In case after case, Dr. Gosnell and his assistants induced labor, forced the live birth of viable babies in the sixth, seventh, and eighth month of pregnancy, and then killed those babies by cutting into the back of their necks with scissors and severing their spinal cords. The damning grand jury statement also includes an unusual observation about its members, quote, we ourselves cover a spectrum of personal beliefs about the morality of abortion. We find common ground in exposing what happened here and in recommending measures to prevent anything like this from ever happening again. But in Washington, there was no similar common ground. Like other heinous crimes that have resonated across the culture and on Capitol Hill, this one appeared to be gaining a political foothold. The indictment was handed up just days before the annual March for Life rally here, and the pro-life caucus has now introduced legislation which would ban all funding for elective abortion government-wide and permanently. And our hope is that not only do, will we completely get federal funding out of this grisly abortion business, 
Uh, and we know if we don't fund it, there will be fewer abortions as a result. The data clearly suggests about a 25% reduction in abortions when public subsidy and public funding is not available. Pro-choice advocates point out that many late-term abortions provided by Dr. Gosnell were already illegal. And a leading pro-choice advocate says this new legislative effort is hypocritical. Quote, as these politicians take control of the House, they want to be able to interfere in our personal private decisions, especially a woman's right to choose. They are out of touch with our country's values and priorities. What happened to the jobs agenda? There is one political entity that clearly bears partial blame for what happened at that clinic. Key employees in the State Department of Health could have shut it all down, but they stopped their inspections, apparently to suit what they believe to be the preference of pro-choice governors. In Washington, Doug McKelway, Fox News. A number of high-profile guests gathered at a funeral service for Robert Sargent Shriver. Several dignitaries, including former President Bill Clinton and members of the Kennedy family, filled Our Lady of Mercy Church in Maryland. They're there to pay tribute to a man who is being remembered for his lifelong devotion to public service. Shriver served as President Kennedy's first director of the Peace Corps and went on to become president of the Special Olympics in 1984. Former President Bill Clinton spoke about what the Sarge meant to their generation and joked about his time with him. For those of you who are my age who were ever involved in seeing how the Peace Corps started or seeing how the, the war on poverty started or watching the rise of legal services, here was a man at the core of a family that had suffered more, borne more, lost more, who showed up every day. and found joy in life. Sergeant Shriver Mary Eunice Kennedy, the sister of John F. Kennedy in 1953, he leaves behind their six children. Shriver died at the age of 95 after years of battling Alzheimer's. Reports show that some U.S. states are underwater with huge debt, now looking for a way to get out. Fox's Jim Engel tells us how they got there. State and local governments are struggling. California Governor Jerry Brown just declared a fiscal emergency and proposed $12 billion in spending cuts. The recessions hit the finances of many states hard, and they're scrambling to pay their bills. But the options to make ends meet are limited. Some states are in perilous position, and they've answered it by you know, having some spending reductions and some tax increases. In Illinois, for example, I think it's nearly a 70 percent increase in the income tax. But that can only go so far before taxpayers revolt, which is why many worry about states coming to the federal government to seek a bailout. The pressures are so strong, I think you'll hear more and more about this possibility over time. But Republican lawmakers have made clear that will not happen. Should taxpayers in Indiana who have paid their bills on time, who have done their job fiscally, be bailing out Californians who haven't. No. So what could the states do if they try all the alternatives and still can't pay their bills? Former Budget Director Peter Orzog notes that, quote, contrary to what many pundits suggest, state governments cannot simply declare bankruptcy. It is thus difficult for states to default. They would generally have to stop paying employees before they stop making debt payments. So some say the law should be changed to allow states to declare bankruptcy. Nobody's drafting legislation, nobody's working on a bill. Rove says there's no serious consideration of that for now and doesn't see it coming until states have exhausted all the other possibilities, such as tax increases and spending cuts. A zero chance that the Congress is going to, in my opinion, proactively pass a bankruptcy law for states absent some crisis from the states that prompts it. One Republican lawmaker said he'll have hearings but not to fashion legislation. Lamar Smith, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, says, quote, while bankruptcy for states may seem like an attractive alternative to state bailouts, there are significant constitutional concerns that should be addressed by congressional hearings. Smith also worries it might encourage more irresponsible spending by the states. Rove notes that even talking about bankruptcy makes it harder for states to borrow money because lenders fear they may never get paid back. In Washington, Jim Angle, Fox News. So ahead on Fox 28 News at 10, pretty soon Google plans to duplicate the success of Groupons.com. And the popular Budweiser commercials seen during the Super Bowl aren't going away anytime soon. We'll explain why after the break.
There was a movie called 2012. With John Cusack. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna BS this and get through it. James is gonna stretch and we're gonna BS it. I'm good at. Okay. And welcome back. House Republicans say they're defending small businesses and voting to repeal health care reform, while the Fed predicts small businesses to lend up loosening. Peter Barnes has more in today's small business report. Table. The House of Representatives voted to repeal President Obama's health care reform plan. Repeal was a top priority for Republicans now controlling the House. The vote was largely along party lines and came after passionate debate. When you order every American to buy health insurance, whether they want it or need it or not, that's a government takeover of health care. When you order almost every business to provide government-approved health insurance or pay higher taxes uh, and send their employees to government-run health exchange programs, that's a government takeover of health care. When a mother of two four-year-old twins goes to buy health insurance and the health insurer says, I'm sorry, we won't insure your family because your four-year-olds have leukemia. Should that be legal or not? That's the question. The law the president signed in March says it should be illegal. This repeal says let's go back to the good old days where the insurance companies made that decision. The repeal is expected to die in the Senate where Democrats remain in control of the chamber. Small business lending was a topic at a forum in Northern Virginia. So, ben Bernanke, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, sure. and Sheila measure, Baer, the chairman of the FDIC, the both predicting lending to small companies will rise this year as banks return to good financial health. That's it for this edition of the Small Business Report. Peter Barnes, Fox Business Network. Google is developing a Groupon competitor. The service will be called Google Offers. It will offer time-limited deals from local vendors such as restaurants. $10, for example, might buy $20 worth of food at a local cafe. The search engine operator is not saying when offers would be available or provide any more details about its plans. It's a solo show for Budweiser as it continues its reign as the only beard advertiser during the Super Bowl. The owner of Budweiser saying he has locked up its position through 2014. The brewer has been the exclusive beer sponsor for 23 years. And for this year's Super Bowl, Budweiser is buying seven 30-second spots, securing its position as the top ad buyer during the game. Still ahead on Fox 28 News at 10, forget The Simpsons, a new animated series is coming to Fox. We'll have a preview for you, plus some big news for Donald Trump's daughter. Stick around to find out coming up after the break.
Welcome back. Well, it turned out to be a nice day today after the clouds and the early drizzle that we had. Things cleared out and warmed up just a little bit. We're still well below normal for this time of year. You can definitely feel it when you walk outside. Some of the places up in the Carolinas, Raleigh only hit freezing today. A little warmer back down here, 53 for Jacksonville. But you could tell when Orlando didn't even hit 60 degrees that it's a cool day. 43 for Atlanta, 48 for Macon and 47 for Charleston. A little warmer here. We did hit 50. That's 11 degrees below our normal. We're going to continue with this for just a little while. Start out at 36, which is just a little bit below that normal. Luckily, we didn't hit that low of 17 set back in 1985. Currently, it is freezing in Savannah, 24 for Augusta, 30 for Macon, and 31 for Atlanta. There's a lot of cold air around the nation. As you can see, big mass of cold air working its way down. Chicago at 9, Duluth at negative 7, but there are places that were a lot colder than that come just a few days ago. So for tonight, Looking at clear and very cold winds out of the northwest around 5 to 10, 24 for Savannah, 22 for Hampton, 23 for Statesboro. Just bitter cold out there, so uh, definitely need to bundle up if you're going to be going out. Take a look outside right now. You can see all the clear skies that we have all the way across the southeast. Things looking pretty good. There's the uh, frontal system that worked its way uh, through earlier today, bringing us the clouds and a little bit of a drizzle and the, slow to, and the snow to the low country, but there is a system working its way across uh, Chicago and Pittsburgh. Both have some big football games tomorrow. Going to be cold in both places. For Pittsburgh, game time looks to be about 10 degrees with a wind chill of about zero. High pressure working its way into our area, and this is what's going to keep things cool tonight, keep skies clear. Luckily, the high pressure is going to continue to work in and keep skies clear for tomorrow. Still looking at a little bit cooler than normal for tomorrow, but should tack on a couple degrees from what we saw today. The high pressure will slowly start to work its way out as the trough forms all along the coast here going into Monday. Monday's still looking good, but going into Monday night and into Tuesday, we'll see an area of low pressure develop here, and that's what's going to help bring us some showers for Tuesday. So for tomorrow, things looking good. Lots of sun and cooler winds out of the northwest around 5 to 10, looking at low to mid 50s down for the south. 53 Savannah and Statesboro, 54 for Heinz. Well, a little cooler there in Tybee at 49 degrees. The low country looking at the same. Lots of sun and low 50s. Hilton Head hitting 50 degrees for tomorrow. So we should round out the weekend with lots of sun, just a little bit on the cool side. Sunrise at 7.23 a.m. High tide is at 10.30. Luckily, we're staying below 8 feet for the tide tomorrow. Shouldn't have much in ways of flooding out. The water winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 knots. So things looking pretty calm. Just going to be a cool day for today's pollen count. Trees are still in the medium range and mold is high. Stick around and have your five-day forecast coming up next. Things looking good for tomorrow, and we're going to attack on a few more degrees coming for Monday. Now, I'm a little optimistic with this 60. We should be close to it. I'm hoping we do hit it. Should see lots of sun starting out cold with that 28 degrees, but then there's the rain coming on Tuesday, still 58 degrees, and that's going to move out cooler for Wednesday and Thursday, and a little bit of wind there for Wednesday, but those overnight lows, thankfully, are going to work their way up. The tomorrow morning looks to be the coldest that uh, that we should be here. But uh, I'm telling you, there's some places that are cold. I've seen one time in my life freezing fog. Have you ever seen that? Freezing fog. Freezing no, fog. I don't know if I would want to. <laughs> it, has, it has to be below 20 degrees below zero. I've seen it once when I lived in Colorado. 23 below zero that morning. A uh, place, Babbitt, Minnesota, oh, wow. yesterday morning. 46 degrees below zero. That's insane. Yeah, so you think we got it bad here with our cold. It is definitely bitter cold up to the north. The whole, the whole nation is looking at a colder than normal winter, not only us. We have been uh, 10 degrees below normal for most of our winter, and it's just it's weird. Either way, don't 50, blame it on me. Yeah, I'm not going to blame it on you just yet, but I'm not looking forward to 53 degrees tomorrow. I mean, it's not compared to other places, I'm sure. Like, mm -hmm. it, we still have it good, but you obviously want to carry your blankets, bundle up. And any chance do you think we might see some snow again? We almost had a chance today throughout Beaufort County right. and the Low Country, but it did not stick. So I'm no, I know there's a lot of 
snow lovers out there who are probably disappointed yeah. well, at that. Well, for the next week or so, no, because this next system that's coming in Monday could be a little bit warmer because it's going to develop off the coast and it's not going to be as, quite as chilly as it was this morning. But uh, yeah, I just, uh, I don't want to see it. <laughs> but it's, it's funny whenever you spend the last couple of weeks like in the 40s and 53 sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much, James. Sure. And you'll be back later to give us another update on the weather. Well, here's a new show we're going to tell you about. Fox already dominates Sunday nights with The Simpsons, Family Guy, and The Cleveland Show. So adding a new animated series about a dysfunctional family and their burger joint tops off the lineup. Fox's Ashley DeBorkin reports. In, drum roll, please. In Fox's new animated series, Bob's Burgers, we find a tight-knit family, plenty of food, and a whole lot of laughs. Uh, okay, no. And when you meet the voice cast in person, you find the exact same thing. I, you are here I with got the it. cast of Bones! I got an ice. <laughs> what do we want to talk about? I What's in the game? today! Whose bones did we find? That's why it's called that. Oh, Again, once you meet the cast of Bob's Burgers, you'll find the exact same thing. We were yelling about Bob's Burgers because Bob's Burgers is great! Dad, forget it. Although for some reason, when we gave them a delicious burger as a prop, they were a little taken aback. That part tough. cut, that part half eaten. There's some weird liquidy... <laughs> That's fine. It's beautiful. It's well, very nice. It smells yeah. wonderful. We love burgers. A oh, burger. You're cute. Meanwhile, they each have reasons why this is a dream gig. We both play women. Both well, he yeah. plays a girl. I play a lady. Is I've never gotten had so many dates in my life. The ladies love it. <laughs> oh. It's really nice to get a job in A, and then also get to come and like um, see people's faces and talk to them. Of, like waking up and talking to yourself. We don't have to talk to ourselves yeah, alone in that's our room. True. Plus, they may be the hardest working people in show business, according to them. It's probably the hardest art form you can accomplish. Yeah, I'm with Harrison Ford or the other A listers you've met. Yeah, yeah, actually, Harrison Ford, Angelina Jolie, every other star that's done animation, we usually have to go out on a retreat after we finish rap, you know, a voiceover. Tina, help! So if there's one thing they want you to take away from all this wackiness, it's to tune into... Bob's Burgers! Sundays on Fox. Do you think cows should be ground up for food? Only if they commit adultery. In New York, Ashley Dvorkin, Fox News. Well, you can add another celebrity to the Hollywood baby boom. Ivanka Trump telling the world on Twitter she is pregnant. Donald Trump's daughter is married to New York Observer Jared Kushner. 29-year-old Trump didn't say when the baby is due. Michelle Obama is returning to her hometown for Oprah. The First Lady will be in Chicago to tape one last episode of Winfrey's nationally syndicated talk show. Mrs. Obama will talk about her plans to launch a campaign to support families with someone serving in the military. The episode will air on Thursday. Winfrey is ending her talk show this season after 25 years. In case you missed it, we'll recap tonight's top stories coming up after the break. What? Yeah, ask, uh, Lindsay got called an athletic supporter. She got called athletic supporter. I'll just say stay with us. Alan will be in with sports next. Stay with us. Alan didn't give us a freaking team.
Naked news. Yeah, well, I mean, it, oh, that would be scary. <laughs> And welcome back. Building homes at lightning speed is a new trend in our area. First Savannah, then Beaufort. Now it's Hinesville's turn. Crews hard at work for the second straight day, building a brand new home for a former soldier who lost his legs serving in Iraq in 2005. In our military source report, Nick Paradise brings us the update on this weekend's Build Brigade. It's just an overwhelming, great feeling, knowing that uh, so many people care about wounded soldiers. Grateful. The word applies not only to Jason Letterman, the man receiving this home, but also to the guys given the opportunity to build it. We've done houses before and a few things for charity work, Habitat for Humanity. But this, is, this is more important and, and this is something that we're, we're really putting quality into this house and making sure that the Letterman ha family gets a maintenance-free house. Jason was hit by an improvised explosive device in 2005 and often uses a wheelchair to get around. Recently, he found Homes for Our Troops, a nonprofit group that specializes in helping wounded warriors. We've built 85 homes so far and turned the keys over all across the country, from California to Oregon to Florida. Builders were on site until around 10 last night. Yeah, we, we run. Today they worked on the roof and electrical and plumbing systems. Sunday we're going we're gonna to start brick in the morning. We're going to have sheetrock going on inside, so we'll have drywall, we'll cover up all the stuff, and we'll have brick going up the facade of the building. They may have been inspired by Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Normally, Homes for Our Troops takes about three months to finish the house, but the builders here at Hinesville are promising to finish this in just a few weeks. No surprise to Staff Sergeant Letterman. These guys are all over. These guys are professionals. And then you got all these soldiers and other people trying to help out too, passing up boards, doing everything they can possibly do to help out. Lewis says Hinesville's came together to build this house like no other community she's seen. Nick Paradise, WJCL, Fox 28, the coastal source.com. Hardin Construction expects to start painting and installing cabinets and flooring in a few days. Workers hope to hand over the keys to Jason in about two weeks. Congressman Jack Kingston made a stop in Savannah this morning. The Republican representative spoke to members of the Georgia Association of Conservation at their annual meeting at the downtown Hyatt. Kingston was recently named the chair of the Subcommittee of Agriculture. He advises anyone receiving federal aid to get ready for some belt tightening. Like any other federal program right now, figure out what you do best, what maybe you can consolidate, what you can cut, because that way you're part of the discussion, and that is the discussion right now. Kingston also expressed optimism that Congress can work together to tanker with and improve the health care reform legislation passed last year. The city of Hardyville celebrates a new location for its police department and courthouse. Hardyville held a ribbon-cutting ceremony at the building on Martin Street. Through grants and other funds, the city purchased it for $650,000. The building includes new and modern security features. City leaders hope the new building will help revitalize the downtown area. With the growth that's being experienced here in Hardyville, you know, it's, it's a nice progression for us. Um, if you look at the before picture, people are absolutely amazed at how much we've progressed and transitioned in the last three and a half years. Every city needs a modern police department. Um, we have a court system here. We keep our evidence there. And also inside this building is a warehouse where we can keep our automobiles in case there's a hurricane or something like that. Now the building was purchased two years ago from a telephone company. Coming up next on Fox 28 News at 10, there was a lot of hot action on the basketball court today. Alan is in with all your sports and highlights next in sports.
It may not be as big of a game as it has been in past years, records-wise, but when Rivals Beach and Savannah High Schools meet up on the hardwood, there is no bigger game in the area. To give you a little hint, normally the game is played at the Civic Center, but because of the circus being in town, the big game was moved over to Beach High School tonight. So out we go to the highlights where the Blue Jackets are up on the Bulldogs in the third quarter, but... The home team looking to come back in that as the quick passes find Jerron Singleton and he puts it up and in. But the Blue Jackets answer back as Jonte Mitchell gets it on the break and he has the nice easy lay in. The Bulldogs keep it up as Tyree Taylor is going to find the twine with the long two-pointer. But Savannah keeps the pressure on as they force the turnover. Kevon Freeman is going to be very unselfish in this one as he gives it up to Mitchell for another pair. Beach doesn't give up. They try to get back into this thing as Brandon Outing is going to have some nice moves right to the rack. But in the end, Savannah High moves their record to 14-4 and on the year with the 54-36 to win. Another boys high school score for you. Bethesda beat Augusta Prep tonight 58-34. to and in girls high school hoops, Effingham County wins their third in a row by beating Evans 45 to 20, the final in that one. To the college game where the Georgia Bulldogs were looking to bounce back from their heartbreaking loss at the buzzer against Tennessee this week as they hosted Mississippi State. The home team Bulldogs with the commanding lead in the second half is Gerald Robinson gets the rock and drains the three ball to push the lead to 20. Then later, Travis Leslie He's going to be uncontested, and he will also nail the three ball. Then Robinson, he's going to come up with a steal of the Bulldogs. Robinson, he's going to give it up to Trey Tompkins underneath, who flushes it home for another pair. Then the dogs from Athens will break the press, and Leslie is going to have a sweet finish for two more as the Georgia Bulldogs roll over the Mississippi State Bulldogs today, 86 to 64 the final. Over in South Carolina, the Gamecocks looking to pull an upset against the Kentucky Wildcats. In the first half, Terrence Jones is going to have the nice crossover against Sam Muldrew, and he finishes with the monster jam for Kentucky. Then in the second half, Muldrew, he's going to pump fake Jones, and he's going to throw down two of the career best 23, but South Carolina would pull it within Five, but that's as close as they would get because late in the game, Bruce Ellington takes it to the rim, but Jones is there for the huge block as the Wildcats hold on to win against South Carolina. 67-58, the final. Out a little closer to home, the AASU Pirates are hosting UNC Pembroke, and the Pirates had the lead late in the game with under a minute to go. Pembroke's Shamel Brackett is going to hit the three ball to make it a one-point lead for the Pirates. AASU's Chris Edwards is going to sink a free throw to make it a two-point lead, but that's all. So the Braves have a chance to tie or win the game, but Keyshore Williams will be there for the Pirates with two huge blocks as they clear the ball and time runs out as Armstrong Atlantic survives UNC Pembroke 67. 65 the final. The Georgia Southern men had another tough day on the court as they fall to Elon tonight, 84-62, the final in that one. The AASU women had a tough task this past week as they welcomed the number one team in the land to Savannah, but their good effort came up a little short against Lander. Today, the Lady Pirates are looking to get back in the win column against UNC Pembroke, but they were still struggling a little bit coming in as UNC Pembroke they would have the early lead, and they were adding to it. As on the break, Jatoya Kemp is going to get the bucket and the foul. Then Brianna Stanton, she's going to have the fadeaway, old-fashioned three-point play, the hoop, and the harm. Later, she adds a couple more to the Lady Braves' lead as she gets the rock in the paint. And the visitors starting to pull away big in this one, but Armstrong tries to do what they can as Brooke Long is going to hit a three-pointer. But the visitors had all the answers today as Talina Faison is going to have the nice, friendly bounce fall. Then as Anya Knauer gets the feed down low, Armstrong Atlantic loses big tonight, 87-56. to the final. The Lady Eagles from Georgia Southern also lose today despite having the lead at halftime. Instead, Furman gets the 58-50 win over Southern. In a little semi-pro action tonight, the Savannah Storm hosting the second-ranked and undefeated Jacksonville Giants. Back and forth in this one early on as 
Leon Frazier hits the three for Savannah with the Giants with the counter. Edward Horton with the alley, and Jermaine Bell is going to have the nice oop. Savannah responds. DJ Henley, he's going to spot up and can the long two-point jumper. But the Giants continue to rock the rim as Nick Whalerly finishes with the flush. The storm continues to hang in there as Ben Chisholm is going to get the ball. He's going to hit a three-pointer in the corner. But Jacksonville starts to pull away as Anthony Lumpkin gets the floater to go. Then as Ronaldo Norman drives and gets two more, Jacksonville opens up the second quarter on a 24 to nothing run as the Storm lose 164 to 128 the final. And of course, you can check all of the scores on our website, thecoastalsource.com. Now, I'm a big Gamecock fan, so I got to say I'm a little disappointed in, in the score today. I but know. They had a big win against Vanderbilt a couple weeks ago. They did, so, so that counts for something. And it, was, right. and it wasn't and it was that much of a loss this time around, but hopefully next year will be right. much better that against them. SEC East is a beast. All right. Thanks so much. We'll stay with us. We'll have a final look at your forecast when we return. <laughs> what? So is this all for weather? Um, do we need to go to him then? Just go to pull up the four, five day and just. Do you want? You we want have a minute. There? Okay. Well, I'll just say. I try not. I'll just. I'll toss to you. Okay. Talk about sunshine. <laughs> Still gonna be cold. <laughs> yeah. No, just go to uh, go to us, and then I'll say, hey. It's it's cool. I'll say whatever comes out my mouth. I don't, <laughs> whatever. Whatever comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, because I got a little planner than the five day, but okay. I can run through the planner really quick and then. I'll make it quick. I, I like they finally changed it. <laughs> One minute. And welcome back. Before we go tonight, James Hopkins is back with us once again. And what's the weather looking like for the next few days? Cold, I'm sure. Well, tonight's going to be frigid. We're going to look at low, mid-20s. So things looking good. But tomorrow, what we're looking at, heading out to church in the morning, it's going to be a little chilly still in the 20s, but we're looking at lots of sun by noontime. We're looking at close to 50 and a little bit over 50 as we hit the 4 p.m. hour. There's your high temp for the day, 53. Tacking on a few degrees as we work our way into Monday, 60 degrees with lots of sun. Tuesday, clouds building, then rain, and then cooling back off by midweek, back to 54 as some uh, wind works its way through on Wednesday. But overnight lows are luckily going to start to work their way back up, too. All right. Thanks so much, James. And remember, for all your latest news, log on to our website at thecoastalsource.com.